Hello, I'm Jess. I'm part of the events team at Northshire Bookstore with locations in Manchester Center, Vermont and Saratoga Springs, New York. For this evening's event, Northshire is thrilled to have partnered with some of our friends at some of the country's very best independent bookstores. Thank you to the wonderful teams at Anderson's Bookshops, Books and Books, Gibson's Bookstore, Left Bank Books, RJ Julia, Westland RJ Julia, and Bookhampton. To all of you here in the audience, whichever store brought you here, thank you so much for being here and for your loyalty to and support of independent bookselling. I know I speak for all these great stores when I say none of what we do would be possible without you. Throughout the evening, please use the Q&A box to ask any questions that you have. We'll save them up and pose as many audience questions as we can a little later in the evening. Now my colleague Rachel will introduce our guests. I'm so pleased to get to be the one to introduce Anthony Horowitz and Paul Dwaran to you this evening, here to discuss Close to Death, the fifth mystery in Horowitz's best-selling and beloved Hawthorne and Horowitz series, which just came out today. I've really been looking forward to this evening, bringing together two authors who are perennial beloved staff favorites at Northshire. Anthony Horowitz is the author of books including Magpie Murders and The Word is Murder, and the best-selling Alex Ryder series for young adults, which has sold more than 19 million copies worldwide. As a TV screenwriter, he created both Midsummer Murders and the BAFTA-winning Foyle's War on PBS. He regularly contributes to a wide variety of national newspapers and magazines and was awarded an OBE. He will be interviewed tonight by Paul Dwaran, author of the best-selling and award-winning Mike Bowditch series, most recently Dead Man's Wake. We're lucky that Paul regularly makes the trip from Maine to visit us at Northshire, and I'm currently working on dates with his publicist for an event for Pitch Dark, his next Mike Bowditch mystery, which will be re released in late June. Please join me in welcoming them both to our screens this evening. Well, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Jess. Um, so yes, I'm Paul Dwaran, and it is my pleasure tonight to have a conversation with a writer I've long admired and uh, uh, felt immensely inadequate compared with in terms of your productivity, Anthony. <laughs> I'm sure you get that quite a lot, don't you? <laughs> well, it's only because I have no social life. I have uh, all okay. I do is sit in a room. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, I, what I want to do tonight is actually start with um, with the new book. Is start with the, the the particular, and then move more towards the general. Uh, since Close to Death is is out in the United States today, and it seems appropriate to kind of focus on that first before we get into talking a bit about your career at large. Uh, and I know that some of our viewers are going to have wonderful questions about all of the, the various things you've done from, from Alex Ryder to Foyle's War to, to the Ryland books, etc. cetera. Um, so Close to Death is the fifth book in your Hawthorne and Horowitz series, correct? Uh, in which you've partnered uh, a really hard-bitten ex-detective inspector named Daniel Hawthorne with uh, a hapless sidekick who coincidentally uh, has the name Anthony Horowitz. Um, Not a coincidence. <laughs> no? I, you mean I've been misreading this all along? Oh, my God. Um, no. I want to talk to you about how you ended up turning yourself into a fictional character. Um, but, you know, first, I think we should just, you know, give you a chance to talk a little bit about Close to Death. The This one takes place in uh, Riverview Close, which is a, or is it Close? How do you pronounce a close. it? Close. It is indeed a close. 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 Which the America is sort of the the London version of what we would call in Florida, for instance, a gated community. And we, we use those words here as well. You know, it's yeah. funny, I've been on the road this week because the book was published in the UK uh, just about five days ago. And I've been talking about close to death on, on the you know, on the radio and TV and in meetings. And I realized, gosh, that sounds such a depressing title. It sounds so awful and sad. But actually, it's a play on words because you're quite right. What you call a gated community, we call a close. And it is set in a close of, uh, of you know, quite high market up end houses with um you know, well-off people. And the whole story is a nightmare neighbor story when an unpleasant family moves into one of the houses and upsets all the sort of the atmosphere and the friend friendships and the and the tranquility of this close. That's when 
tempers rise and murder happens. <laughs> yeah, I was what, what what interested me was how you managed to take this very contemporary uh, living situation and turn it into a a version of an Agatha Christie village. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, is that it is, of course, redolent of, of Agatha Christie stories because it is a closed community. And I think all the gold, great golden age crime writers did love their, you know, their villages, their hotels, their um, their their, their cruise liners, their whatever it might be that would bring, you know, bring people together in a sort of a almost a locked room or a, at least a sort of in close proximity to each other. But actually, one of the first problems I had writing the book, or the first challenges, was what characters was I going to create? Because I didn't want it to be an Agatha Christie family of what would you, what would Agatha Christie have put in there? She'd have had a a mysterious millionaire, or almost certainly a retired soldier of some sort, <laughs> a, an actress, uh, you know, an, a, a butler, a, a maid, a, a governess, and uh, and I wanted to avoid those sorts of sort of who done it stereotypes. I also wanted to have connections with reality. But at the same time, this is an Agatha Christie style murder mystery, so they had to be sort of slightly peculiar too. So what I did was I took ordinary people and I gave them a twist. Mm. Yeah, successfully in my mind. It was a it was a real joy to read. Um the the in this installment of the, the series, you've done a couple of you've added some twists too. Uh, you uh in this one, um you're not following a contemporaneous murder. You're writing those... an incident that happened in Hawthorne's past. Um, and in fact, I, I find them to be even less helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, let, let me let me cut in. I mean, it's, uh, cause, you know, it's sure, really difficult it's... to talk on a screen. I never know quite when I should start talking or I just listen. But let me just jump in. For those people who are listening to this broadcast, obviously, whatever, who have not, uh, picked up one of these books, I should explain to start with the sort of the premise of the whole thing, which is that in the first four books, this is number five, as you correctly said in the series, we have a detective called Daniel Hawthorne, who has been fired from the police from Scotland Yard for uh, a crime that he committed. It's very murky. We're not quite sure really what happened. He's now a private detective. And the whole idea of all the books is that he has uh, decided to hire a writer to write about his investigations in order to share the money 50-50 and, and do, you know, give himself a pay rise. So that is a setup. And what makes the books peculiar and unusual is that the writer he hires to work with him is me. And so I end up as the, the sidekick, the Watson to his homes, the Hastings to his Poirot. And for four books, this is what has happened. Uh, the word is murder, sentence is death, line to kill, and a twist of a knife. But now we come to the fifth book, and I decided to vary the formula a little bit, mainly because I'm not a big fan of formula. I like books to surprise. And so in this book, the setup is, is that the publishers want book number five, but nobody has been murdered. And so I persuade Hawthorne to tell me about a cold case that he investigated, so I'll have a fifth book. And therefore, in this one, I'm not the sidekick. I am the writer. But what makes the book fun is, is that Hawthorne and I are arguing about the book and arguing about every single page while I'm writing it. So it's a book about a crime, but it's also a book about the writing about a crime. Well, you know, that that's actually, it gets me to, to the, the subject of how you came to create this character of Anthony Horowitz in the first place. Um, because on the surface, it is, it, it, you know, it could be read as kind of metafictional or, uh, but the way that it, it, it reads is, is uh, I mean, it, it reminds me actually of Magpie Murders as well this way is, yes, it's, a, it, it's, it's playing with the genre. It's playing with our expectations about what a good detective novel is. And yet it's, you know, not in a self-important, uh, <laughs> philosophical way it's really there's there's such a sense of fun um in the way that you're going at these things um I'm, I'm so glad you used that word because fun is what i'm all about i think that murder mysteries or at least my murder mysteries should be fun they should be entertaining they have jokes in them they're quite light-hearted i'm not that interested in extreme violence i don't get too serious about anything really i'm out to sort of to beguile to tease to trick you know, hopefully to baffle and, 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 you know, keep people guessing until the very end. 
And all I'm trying to do is to do it in a different way. I mean, that's the only that's the only reason I put myself into these books. And it certainly wasn't about being self-important or about being pompous or about sort of saying, look at me. I am only the narrator in these books and I and and I'm a sidekick. And as Hawthorne would quickly tell you, I'm not a very good sidekick. I'm always giving <laughs> stuff away. You know, whenever he confronts a killer, I say something that that gives something away and often ends in somebody's death. In two of the books, I end up in hospital with a knife in me. Uh, I am not that clever uh, in these books. My publishers were really worried that when I pitched this idea to them, they said, look, you're not going to boast about your career or your book sales or anything. And I, and I said, no, no, I'm, I am just the narrator. Um, and, 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 and now they love it. You know, they can see that this character is a complete idiot. Uh, and that makes them smile. Uh, well, so. I was going to say that you've you've been very hard on poor Horowitz. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I'll <laughs> tell you, you him that. and and you know, and, and he's uh, been humiliated and misled. And the truth is, Paul, that it is yeah. it is an accurate depiction of me. I mean, you know, to anybody listening or watching us right now, I want to say I am not the central character in this book. I am very much on the side. These books mm -hmm. are not about me. They are murder mysteries, and they are whodunits. And they are they they provide all the joys that a whodunit I hope uh, should have. But the fact of the matter is, is that yes, I am in there, and it is a pretty accurate everything you read about me in these books, my life. You know, for example, I'll give you a, a, a good example in episode two, in book two of of this series, the sentence is death. It opens on the set of Foil's War, and the mm. scene that we are shooting is exactly a scene that appeared in that show. And I described very accurately all the problems we were having that day. The only difference is that in this version of that true event, Hawthorne turns up in a taxi with music blaring out of it, drives onto the set and destroys the shot. And I, of course, get the blame for inviting him. So that is sort of how the dynamic works. OK, so you're, this is not some sort of a, a psychological uh, confession about your own <laughs> inadequacies. I think the words you're looking for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it is it is just me. I and mean, you know, the new book, for example, close to Oops, we've had a, a freeze here. It happened where I live. Mm -hmm. Um uh and uh and and the, the the world of the book is my world. It is exactly how how you know how how it is. Um wonderful. You know, as so um you've have announced that you plan on writing 12 of these and i wonder i, I did yeah go on <laughs> are you already backing off that uh no no i no i mean i plucked the number sort of out of the air i thought okay. when i started i knew it was going to be a series and there is a sort of an arc to the whole thing you know hawthorne is a very damaged character you you've said he's not an easy man he's we have quite a spiky relationship i do like him but it's clear that something has happened in his life that has really damaged him. And uh, one of the sort of things that sort of the arc of the book is me in the books, always trying to find out what happened in this town called Reef when he was a child. What happened to his parents? Why is he adopted? Um, you know, what, what has turned him into, into this very difficult adult human being? And I keep trying to search for it. And so there's there's this arc with every single book we learn a little bit more about it. But I, I just sort of decided that 12 would be about right to finish that journey. You know, that I don't want to do 20 or 30 of these things. Uh, 12 just sort of just felt right. Now, it might end up I just do 10. I might do 15. But for the moment, I'm sticking to 12. Okay. Yeah, and and, and in fact, actually, in this, uh, uh, in Close to Death, we we get uh, a, another peek into his past and, and learn that before there was Horowitz, there was... John uh, Dudley, this other, uh, this other sidekick. John Dudley is a much better sidekick than me. He is much smarter than I am. He's much more professional. He says things that are sensible rather than always stupid. I quite envy him. I have a difficult relationship with him in this book because he's, he's a better me than me. <laughs> yes. I keep him away from your wife. <laughs> <laughs> that never occurred to me. Um, so in the United States, I, you know, it, it's interesting. I I know that you that you your fame increased here to the extent you, we we talk about fame among <laughs> among authors, right? 
um, with the uh, with the broadcast of Magpie Murders, which was very well received and uh, um, uh, got a lot of, I, I would imagine, inspired a lot of people to go looking for your other books as well. Uh, but the funny thing about that was I, in thinking about that word magpie, um, it occurred to me that you're something of a magpie yourself. You are a, a wonderful mimic. Um, you know, you've you've done these uh, James Bond novels. You've done uh, the Sherlock Holmes novels. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you've talk, talked a little bit about how, or actually more than a little bit about how those various uh, deals came together, um, and, and I don't know if, if you if there's anything more you want to add about that, but but I I am curious about how how those you know for for lack of a better word continuation novels are sort of working in your overall creative life these days. You know whether you look forward to them or. There's so much to unpick in what you said. I mean, let's yeah. start with the fact that magpies um, don't actually, um, magpies steal. They don't imitate. So you're calling me a plagiarist. Um, <laughs> uh, when, when, in, uh, I'm sure accidentally. Or maybe I'm I should have called the book. If I'd, called the, if I'd called the book Parrot Murders, then I would be imitating. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, but that's, a, that's a side issue. I mean, the question about continuation novels is, I've written um, five of them. Two Sherlock Holmes's, The House of Silk and Moriarty and three James Bonds. And that's about it. I don't think I plan to do any more at all, but I certainly don't plan to. I might. You never know what comes your way. But they were an important part of my life because when I was growing up, the two biggest influences on me as a nascent beginning writer were Ian Fleming and Conan Doyle. I got given all the Sherlock Holmes novels when I was 17, but I started reading Ian Fleming even earlier when I was about 11 and 12. And just devoured all the Bond novels because they provided everything that was missing from my life. I was in a boarding school. I was quite unhappy. Um, it was an all boys boarding school. So, you know, we had horrible food. We had British weather and dreadful rain. We had no girls anywhere in sight, of course. And, uh, and it was quite a sort of a dark, brutal atmosphere. And here's James Bond with sunshine and adventure and escape and Ursula Andress and all the rest of it. So, you know, I, so, so the Bond books were, were huge in my life. Sherlock Holmes, I, I, uh, Sherlock Holmes, when I was 17, came in and, and persuaded me that I would write crime. One day I would have to write crime because I so loved the stories and the twists and the turns in Doyle's work. And um, when, you know, 40 years later, I was asked to do continuation novels, the only two authors I would have accepted were those two authors. I wouldn't have done a continuation novel. I mean, I love Jane Austen. I love Thomas Hardy, Charles Dickens. But I wouldn't do a continuation novel for them because... What I really wanted to do when I wrote those books was to move in. I wanted to live in 221B Baker Street or go to Regent's Park and sit in the office with them and Miss Moneypenny and, and be inside those worlds. And that was sort of the pleasure of it for me. I'm very happy that the books did so well and that there were five of them. But I don't have any plans to do any more continue continuity novels because, you know, 12 Hawthorns and... and uh, you mentioned Magpie Murders in your conversation. Incidentally, I should say that we have, I was just yesterday watching episode six of Moonflower Murders, which is the mm -hmm. sequel to Magpie. Leslie Manville returns. It'll be back on PBS, hopefully later this year. So that's number two in the series. And I'm writing a third book about Susan Ryland too. So, so a lot, sorry, a lot of going on in that answer. I'm sorry, I, I've bounced around. No, no, place, well, I, I picking up on all the points you made. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's that's really. I'm sure a lot of people here are going to be very excited about all that. Um, I uh, so I read that you knew it from the age of ten that you wanted to be a professional writer, and I wondered if there I, was a a, partic a particular book that had inspired you that way, or it was. It wasn't so well. It was a book. I mean, it was a series of books. I mean, and I've I've half answered that because I mentioned being at a boarding school, you know, which is something that we British do very very well is to take children at a young age and destroy them for life by putting them into absolutely horrible schools, which your, their parents have paid a lot of money for. We have schools that are free and which are state schools and anybody can go to, and then we have these very expensive private schools, which I was sent to, and where everything seemed to be designed to make me have no confidence in myself, no sense of self-worth, no happiness, 
no sort of understanding of life and to feel completely worthless when I came out. And this was a horrible, brutal place to, to be, you know, with beatings and everything you may have read about uh, about British prep schools. And when I was there, the one place where I felt safe and happy, where I, I was an unsuccessful child, but I don't think I was an angel. I was not. I was a, I was, I was a very plump and, 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 and out of shape kid. I wasn't good academically. I was, I was lazy. I was many things. But, but I think I was a good kid. All kids are good. That's a point, of course. All kids have good in them. The mm-hmm. secret of life is to find it and to encourage it and to make them, you know, pursue their, their light in their life. But this did not happen to me until I found myself in the library and I began to read books. And the books I read were not, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. There is a clue if I lean here as to what I most loved as a child in the library. Uh, and it's still with me behind my shoulder on that shelf there. And it's not the skull. It is the Tintin <laughs> rocket. I loved Tintin. Over here, we have Thompson and Thompson, the, uh, also out of Tintin. They inspire me to this day. Uh, and those were the first books I read. And then I started to read other sorts of adventure books and sort of kids' books of one sort or another. And what persuaded me I was going to be a writer was that, first of all, the books were a protection from my life at this school. I could escape into these stories and forget all the misery and unhappiness of my life. But then I, in the dormitories, we slept six kids to a room, you know, little little kids in, in sort of army style beds in cold rooms, far away from their families, all sad and lonely and and scared. And and to, to cheer the other kids up, I began to tell stories. I started mm-hmm. to make up my own story. And do you know something really extraordinary happened? First of all, the kids, the other kids who were my age, talking 10 years old here, loved my stories and wanted more. Every night they wanted more stories. I became more popular. I had friends. I got punished a lot. You weren't meant to talk after lights out. So I was always being hiked out of bed and made to stand in the corridor. But nonetheless, I found myself. I realized, despite what your teachers are telling you, you do have a talent. You know, you, you're not completely useless. and and. I decided, age 10, that I would be a writer. And if I even decided, I knew I would be a writer. There was never a plan B. There was never an alternative. It's all I've ever done. And and the greatest blessing of my life and the, and the greatest fortune of my life is that somehow, um, uh, Mary Baker's saying on that thing, just like David Copperfield, that is my second favorite uh, Dickens novel. I love that book so much. Uh, and I do think of David Copperfield as a sort of a slight parallel to my life. But, you know, it's what I've always done since then. Yeah, it's, you know, and I really, that really resonates with me because I also knew at about age 11 that I wanted to be a novelist. I I remember putting down The Hobbit after I had read it for the first time. And I, I was in this state of, you know, intense emotional, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I, I can't even put a word to it, but I, 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 what I came away feeling was, you know, this is how I, I want to write stories that make other people feel the way that I'm feeling right now. And, you know, these, uh, you know, I, I, I do this full time now and I can't believe it either that this is my life. Um, I think. Well, it's, it is wonderful, you know, because it's, I think that, well, to succeed and to be paid for something that you would do anyway. I mean, I, I look at my life, I think, what would have happened if I hadn't been published or if the books hadn't taken off? Or... And incidentally, I wrote 10 books, 10 books that were all published, but which did not sell in very large quantities and which could have been the end of my career until I wrote the 11th book, which exploded and suddenly my life changed completely. And one of the things that does worry me about the world we live in now is, is the new writers, because you, you know, you pull your, you, you know, you're younger than I am, but you're still not a, you know, kid writer. What worries me is that, is that young writers, beginner writers, don't get the chances I got. My mm. publisher stuck with me for 10 books and waited for the one that would take off. It did. These days, I don't think a publisher will stick with a writer for more than two or three before they say, sorry, we can't do any more. Mm. I wanted to talk a little bit about about the other um, the other aspect of your professional life, which is that you've been you've written a lot of things. I mean, from journalism to plays to television, obviously. Um, and 
I, I got such a kick out of an interview I, I, I listened to with you uh, where you were talking about that whether you're an aspiring author or you're you know, an international bestseller, the job doesn't change in the sense that you're sitting alone in a room <laughs> with your imagination. You know, you know, you know what I've always said? This, uh, the, you know, the, from my experience, the difference between, between being a beginner writer and being a successful writer is that the room has got a bit bigger. <laughs> that's about it uh you know it's a, and it's in maybe a slightly nicer part of london now but it's but you know you know as well as i do and there you are sitting with a lot of books behind you even if i am told confidentially but they're not all but those are not your books behind you well, this for uh, sure. you, your your <laughs> wives no no uh it runs in the family obviously the the, the love of words um but it's uh it, it, it it's it's a, it's a strange life, you know, that we have, the, the amount of time we spend by ourselves. Uh, you know, I always say, you know, one of the great joys of it in a way is if you want to be a teacher, you need a building and you need lots of kids to come in. If you want to be a, a pilot, you need an aeroplane. If you want to, if you, I don't know, you want to be a technician, you need computers and, and software. But a writer needs just two things, and here they are, a pen and a piece of paper. And it, and and you're away. But But the downside of it is, is that, we're on our own, you know. We're stuck in a room. We 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 are. Uh, we they only let us out when we have a new book out, and and then they whisk us round and then lock us up again for the next one. Well, that's why I wondered about your work. You know, your dramatic work, writing plays and television. You know, is necessarily collaborative, and I I wondered, you know, do you get something from that dramatic work that helps you when you have to return to your novelist desk? You sort of feel like I you've had you know you've kind of scratched your social itch. You've worked with other people. No, I don't think it's quite like that. You know, I mean, I, I, ha I, I, have, I have friends. I go out in the evenings. I have, I have a wonderful wife and children and uh, family and uh, and and uh, you know, yes, I spend about ten hours a day in this seat in this room where I am now, but that leaves twenty four hours. Uh, leaves another fourteen hours, and uh, of those fourteen hours, okay, maybe six are asleep, but that still gives me eight hours of of, of socialization and and theater and movies and um and dinners and walking my dogs and uh and meeting people all the rest of it so i i don't see it quite that way uh but you know the see the secret for me is how to make sitting in this room fun and exciting and mm. the answer to that is that i live my life not in this room but in the books that i am writing that's mm. where i really am you I know mean, if i'm writing a new novel or close to death or any of the other books that i'm doing I'm not here in Richmond on Thames in London. I am wherever the book takes me. And that, and, and that immersion means that I can forget when I'm alone. I can forget the walls of this place and live entirely my life inside the book. Yeah, that's the, I, I, I certainly, you know, understand that that feeling as well. I my, my day, sure. my days tend to to not be. Uh, quite as long as yours at my writing desk. Although as my deadline approaches, my days get longer and longer and longer until I'm until I'm putting in 10 hour days. But I, I reflect on the fact that there really isn't anything else that I would I could do. I could see myself doing for 10 hours and enjoy. But do you write TV as well as books? I do not. Because I didn't really answer your question. I have a different between the two. TV, I was trying to say, is not where I, I, I was sort of half onto your question. Yeah. I don't find TV providing the social side of my existence. That's why I was talking about all the mm. things I do. I love writing TV, mainly because my wife, Jill Green, is my producer. So okay. we work together. And it was Jill who, who with me, created Foiled War and also Magpie Murders, two, two, two shows that, that I think you've mentioned in this talk. And I love working with her because she's much smarter than I am. And I love getting out there and meeting directors and, and, and actors and designers and all the different people in that world i never feel part of the world because you know they're all working together on a set and they're making the show i'm still distant from them by the time they all come together my work is over so i'm never part of the team quite but i still love that sense of being part of a sort of a huge group making these extraordinary shows hopefully they are extraordinary that that, 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 that come to life sort of in front of your eyes that said if, if I had to only write one thing, I'd choose book. Mm, mm. Yeah, and mysteries too, I, I expect. Although maybe maybe Alex Ryder and the Spies. Well, Alex Ryder too. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that Alex Ryder seems to have, have brought a, a generation of kids in this country anyway to reading. 
you know, I'm a great supporter of, of libraries and of the importance of books and how reading brings us together, makes us understand each other, explains humanity. I talk a lot, you may know, but I've recently given up on um, Twitter or X as it was called, and I've, I've stopped doing any social media. And the, the sheer joy I feel of not having that in my bloodstream anymore is mm. hard to describe. It seems to me that literature and fiction and reading are the exact opposite of social media and its and such because it brings such joy and humanity and understanding to people instead of prejudice and fear and hatred, uh, which I which I was feeling more and more when I was on X. And you know, I'm speaking like a convert now. I tell you what I'm speaking like. I'm speaking like somebody in remission, somebody who's been <laughs> suffering from an illness, and my doctors finally say, you know, Anthony, you're better. And that's how I feel. Well, and the other thing I think about about reading, say, lo- you know, long form fiction is it requires anyone, a child or an adult, to pay attention and to be able to, you know, to immerse oneself in in a story or, you know, as opposed to these dopamine hits you get from. I think I think you yeah, I agree with that to an extent, although I wouldn't use the word pay attention. I would say that reading and I don't think people get this. People talk about reading as a leisure activity and something which is sort of just a pleasure. But you know, what is so great about reading is that it is actually in its own way just as creative as writing. People don't seem to understand that when you read a book, you're doing something really quite extraordinary. You're taking hieroglyphics, little shapes or letters as we know them, making them into words, the words you then put into sentences which come paragraphs and pages and your brain is processing this whole, the whole time but it's doing more than that because when you're reading a book you begin to see the world that is being described you hear the voices you meet the people you see the entire landscape that's spread out in front of you you start to draw your own conclusions about what people are saying is it true can i trust this character so in fact it is an act of creativity second only or perhaps equal to writing and this is why in the world of, of Hitless and what YA fiction, which I have been writing for many, many years, you know, you can just tell the school that has a a well stocked library and a librarian, hopefully, and 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 has lots of books and 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 reaches out to all the kids in the school. That school, the children of that school have a light in them, a light in their eyes, and and a confidence in their speech and a and a humanity in their in their understanding of other people but but other schools which don't have libraries often in less privileged areas instead let's not forget that reading and books is still a, a great divider when it comes to classes and to and to and to different levels of wealth but but kids who have access to books and who are encouraged to books and i see that uh, georgie has just said primary school librarian here you might if i may say so are my hero because goodness knows librarians are the very much the beating heart of any school um that that to me is has been a lot about what my life has been about and that's why when we were talking about television versus books and i said to you that books is what i would most want to 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 write is because i think that the value of a book the way it lingers in your mind and in your heart and in your consciousness consciousness and the way it it sort of gives you empathy and understanding of everybody around you is is there is nothing quite like it not you know film tv plays i write all of them but books are where you really touch people in the heart yeah i I would agree and i you know you've also um talked a lot in, in in interviews about how rewarding it is to have not just one generation of of alex Ryder fans now but multiple generation sort of coming up to you and 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 thanking you for how you changed their lives and made them read well you know it's it's listen i'm getting old i i I had a big birthday this just just a week or so ago and i'm sort of heading to the end of another decade in my lifetime and one of the few pleasures that i find in being the age i am is when i meet somebody who is maybe 30 25 30 35 and they meet me and they turn into an eight-year-old in front of me because they <laughs> read Alex Ryder when they were that age. And now they're meeting me all these years later. And I, I love to think, you know, I have been one molecule in your life for maybe 10, 20 years that I'm part of your development in a very tiny way. I mean, you know, parents and teachers and, and friends and life have, have, 
have have a you know much more influence than I do. But I love the idea that I have perhaps contributed a tiny little bit to somebody's life, and and, and that makes my work worthwhile. And I've always said that writing is not about how many copies you've sold, how many awards you win, how many weeks you've been on a bestseller list. It is just about touching other people in that way. And I love it. I love it. Even though it does remind me how old I am when I meet this sort of, you know, young man who goes back to boyhood because they've met me. I've done it myself, incidentally. I have met my literary heroes. And I yeah. felt that sense of, oh, my God, it is him. And, and you know, how can I even say hello? And it's it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It is. It absolutely is. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I've I've had uh, teachers come up to me and 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 tell me that they're teaching my books in their in their classes. You know, to especially to boys who don't want to read, and um, uh, I did not get into this with that expectation because I was not writing necessarily for for children or young adults. And honestly, it is the most rewarding thing that has happened to me as a professional author is to hear that I've I've had that kind of effect. And I can only imagine what it's like for you who, you know, who, who have written for so many, um, you know, millions of, of young people. It's uh, it really is something special. It is. Well, we're agreed on that. Yeah. I don't know if we want to get to questions here. I don't want to, uh, you know. Well, I noticed there are quite a few of them. I'll answer one yeah. straight away. Kathleen asked me who my literary heroes were. I just spotted that as that went up. So I've got to just say very quickly that my literary heroes are Tintin. If you mean fictional characters, they are Tintin. David Copperfield is another one. Um, uh, James Bond and Sherlock Holmes, of course. Um I guess Poirot. He's not my favorite detective, but the works of Agatha Christie have had such a huge influence on my life. Uh, who else? Oh my goodness, who are yours, uh, Paul? Tell me who your uh, literary uh, heroes are. I, I think you, I, you actually talked about a bunch of a bunch of mine as well. I mean, Holmes is is continues to be. I've always sort of, you know, wanted to be Watson. I, oh, how you know, funny! Not I, Holmes. I, I did not want to be Holmes. I wanted to be Watson. I uh, I really liked the idea of of sort of tagging along with somebody who was smarter and braver than me, and be but being somebody that he depended upon. I don't know what that says about me as a personality. I think it's fantastic. I totally get you because I've always said that you know the thing about Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson is that it is the greatest friendship yes. in British literature. They are such wonderful friends, and the truth is that what Sherlock Holmes is not that attractive a character. He's, you know, he's quite aloof. He's cold. He doesn't read books. He doesn't listen to music. He doesn't seem to like good food. Uh, he's untidy. He takes drugs. He's, uh, you know, he's not an easy character. But it is the fact that Watson, who you want to be, has this enormous admiration for him. And it's, it is Watson who is our doorway, our portal to Sherlock Holmes. And, and that's sort of what makes the books work. So, you know, I've been talking about sidekicks and me being a stupid sidekick in Close to Death and other books. But actually, Watson is not stupid. He is a wonderfully complete, intelligent and, 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 and kindly man. And it is, his, it is his admiration of Holmes that makes those books work. So you should be Watson. And I, I think Thank you even have a certain physical resemblance. <laughs> Uh, we have a lot of great, oops, sorry, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> we have a lot of great audience questions that have come in in the Q&A box. And um, audience, if you're, you can add more there, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, we have one that came from Paula. Um, Paula asks, you say that fun is what I'm all about. Um, you're so prolific, while well, many writers despair of getting through the next book. Can you tell us more about how you keep it fun? Paul, I, I don't know if you're a writer yourself. It sounds to me from your question that you probably are. So it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer because I don't try to analyse these things too much. I have talked about immersion and the idea of always escaping into the next book. And that, for me, is part of the answer. I, 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 I walk through life and every day I have 10 
or 20 different ideas for books. I think ideas are everywhere. Everything you see has a story attached to it. Everyone you meet, everything you hear. It's grabbing one of those ideas and saying, yes, this is the one. This is my next step. This is different to anything I've done. This is challenging. This is different. This is difficult, maybe, but 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 it's still going to do, it's going to take me outside my company. Yes, I'm going to go with this. And then it, losing myself in there, that's where the fun is. It's not about worrying, you know, can I get this book done? Will I find a publisher? Will it sell? I always say there are two types of writer. One sees the book as an object to be created, which is something over there. Or the other one dives inside the book. And I suspect Paul is perhaps in that second category uh, where where you simply live in the book and enjoy it and 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 everything is fun until it's over yes i have um, a question from leslie and a question from l which are both very similar so i'm just going to read leslie's i think when reading the two series concurrently magpie and hawthorne i was struck by how difficult it seemed to write two mystery series at the same time does it ever get confusing? Did one of the concepts, ideas, characters appear appear to you first? Um, well, Magpie came before Hawthorne, just chronologically, um, and I don't write them at the same time. I mean, you know, I've I've finished Close to Death. I'm talking about it now. Although today I have been writing, I can't put it here next to me. Is this exciting? I'm going to show it to you. This is this is uh, not even that's not even it's it, that is the next book. That's 102,000 words, I think, or something of that sort, of the next book. Um, and that, that's a new um, Susan Ryland. That's a sequel to Moonflower Murders. But that's the next one. So I compartmentalize. I don't do two things on the same day. And otherwise, it does sometimes get difficult to do it, uh, to, to, um, to remember, you know, actually the killer is a killer in the other book, not in this one. So you could take him out again and put someone else in. So it is, it is a case of keeping everything separate. Uh, but also it helps that because I'm running books and TV and films and some journalism still, that, that you know, I've got different sections of my brain that deals with, with each one of them. This next question actually sort of related. It came from Abigail um, and she says, you're so talented at adapting and expanding other writers' worlds, as you guys touched on. Um, what are some of the challenges in finding your own voice, particularly given that you're a character? Um, in the Hawthorne novels, um, well, Abigail, that's another very interesting question. But it's the other way around, actually. I have a strong voice. I know exactly how I write. I know I can hear myself when I'm writing my, my work. And I think I have a, a certain style, which is, you know, it's not particularly flowery or clever, but it is my style. When I'm writing Holmes and, and writing Bond, my job is to lose my voice. It's to ventriloquize. I write those books as if I was Ian Fleming or Conan Doyle. And when I'm writing a continuation novel, I read what they've done. Actually, it's not a lot to read. 14 uh, Bond novels or 14 Bond books, two of them are collections of short stories. And I think something like 62 are uh, short stories and four novellas from Doyle. So it's not a huge body of work. And I read every word of it and try and work out what their tropes are, what their mannerisms are. Why are those books so successful? Why do people love them? What makes them so, what is their voice? And, and I, I study that, and my job is to be invisible. These are books are not by me. They are by those authors if they were still alive to write them. So, so it's not a question of, of refinding my own. My, my voice is, is, is in my books. But when I, when I do continuity novels, I have to be invisible. Mm -hmm. Monique asks, uh, she says, I'd like to ask Anthony where he begins in developing a story. Does he start with an event, with a character, or a premise? And what is his developmental process? I start with this. I always have notebooks that I um that I uh that I do all my work in. So this here is is this is a notebook here of of uh the sequel to Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders, and it this and and every single page of this has lots and lots and lots and lots of pages of notes in this thing are me developing the story and putting in the clues and creating the characters, asking myself questions. I draw diagrams sometimes to, to, um, to, to, to allow, I'm trying to see if there are any here to, to pull out. Here is, I mean, this is a family of, of all the different characters and how they relate. Uh, and, and 
I'm, I'm tr- doing it very quickly, this thing, because people might freeze it on YouTube or something. I mean, they can spot <laughs> yes, they who, who the murderer is. <laughs> but don't do that, because it'll, it'll spoil the book for you. But, but, but that's, that's how I work it. It is a process. Sometimes the planning of the book takes me longer than the writing of the book itself. Are you that way, Paul, or are you one of these writers who just starts and writes? Uh, I start and write actually. So it's my second drafts that are the, where I have to prune away all the dead material and put in the red herrings. And that's where my books become my books. Um, but I, 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 you know, I've tried a, a few times to do that, to do elaborate outlining and, and, and diagramming, and it just doesn't seem to work for me. But, you know, one of the great things about what you've just said is that every writer is different. We all, you know, one of the great joys about being a writer is there are no rules, no laws. You know, mm-hmm. my friend Ian Rankin, who is, uh, you know, the creator of Rebus, which are, his books are so popular in America, he he just, just starts writing. He doesn't really have an idea where it's going. He just starts, writes the first sentence and follows it to the end. And he's a wonderful writer. There are no rules. I was asked about how I do it. And I am a structuralist. I love to have everything planned out. It doesn't necessarily mean that I follow the plan the whole time, but it, whatever I write, I know sort of where I'm meant to be. So we have not a lot of time, but we're going to try to get two last questions in. Um, this one came from Elle. Um, Elle says, as a teacher, the story you told about your schooling is so sad to me. Will we learn more about your childhood from the revealing of Hawthorne's childhood as you develop his character further? There are parallels, but your teacher, I didn't catch the name of the person who asked the question. It was... Um, it would, they, they just gave their first initial L. L, that's right. Well, L, first of all, if you are a teacher, let me say how much I admire teachers. I was unlucky when I was being at school. Uh, uh, a lot of a teacher should never have been allowed near children, but modern teachers are wonderful, inspiring people. And I thank you for your question. And I thank you for the work which you do. Um, and you, I, I'm not sure now, I've forgotten what the question was. Remind me again. It was. Will we re- learn more about Hawthorne's childhood? Yes, you will. Hawthorne's childhood does have some parallels with what I went through, but I will say now that because I, I don't like to do what is expected, and the books will take you down one road to a very obvious destination, but don't worry, it's the wrong destination. <laughs> I like that. Mm-hmm. All right, and we have time enough for one more question. This one comes from Nicola asking, are you very specific or picky when it comes to naming characters? And how many times does a character's name change before you've decided which to use in the final draft? Um, Well, Nicola, I think when the name of a character is one of the most important things that a character has. I I, I see Paul nodding there, so I assume that that you're, you're about to nodding in agreement. Mm-hmm. My love of Dickens has taught me this. You know, when when you're if you're going to a school and you are told that your teacher is going to be Mr. Wackford Squeers, or if there's a guy living down the road and his name is Ebenezer Scrooge, you're going to probably want to avoid those two guys simply because of their names. Now you can't be quite as sort of as sort of big as that and so obvious as that. That's a Victorian device, but nonetheless, I think the name of somebody is important. Alex Ryder, which was a spy who is now. Uh, lived through 14 books and has really made my career getting that name absolutely right was was vital and if his name had been shall we say i don't know percival percival rider or or, or something or percival percival fortescue or something i don't know charles fortescue Macmillan. you know would people read it anymore you know for that matter you know would you have read a book with sheringford holmes and dr ormond sacker as two main characters. Those were the original names of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Names do matter hugely. I do change names quite a lot. And sometimes names just sort of fall into my into my um into my into my head. Now, and I don't quite know why, but 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 they they just do. Um I'm trying to think of one which is um oh I've I've gotten her name now. I've just created <laughs> Go on. I think Atticus Pund was a <laughs> was well. Was Atticus Pund. Fired. There's reasons for that name. Of oh, I know. Did, I know. It did work <laughs> terribly, terribly well. I'm just trying to find. There's a name of a character I just created last week. She's a policewoman, and um, and she's um. Let me see if I can find her name here because I've, I've forgotten what it is now. I'm afraid I write so many different characters that um. Here she is for now. Um, 
she's a I created this character of a policewoman in her story, and she's very she's Scottish slightly, and she's got a very thin face, carrot coloured hair that falls down in untangled un, un, to uneven strands. She really, really hates Susan Ryland, and for some reason, I have called her Detective Constable Emma Wardlaw. And Wardlaw is the name of a Scottish writer. I picked it out of a, a out of a biographical dictionary, and somehow that name absolutely sums her up for me. The moment I came upon that, DC Wardlaw, and then Emma Wardlaw, because Emma is one of my favourite novels, Jane Austen, and it's such a nice name with such a strange surname, and this woman is such a sort of a mixed bag of unpleasantness. She started to live, and you know, you've got to remember that often the first thing you know about somebody is their name. You're told, hello, this is, and it is from that moment you begin to decide, do I like this person? Are they going to be my friend? Are we just going to shake hands and pass like ships in the night? Names really matter, and I spend a lot of time trying to get them right. Great last question, by the way. Mm. We are unfortunately out of time. I know, Anthony, that it's quite late in the UK, so um, we have to wrap up there. But thank you both so much for taking the time to talk this evening. This has been absolutely delightful. Can I just say a big thank you to Paul? Great questions. Love talking to you. Thank you. Same here. Thank you. And thank you to the audience. And thank you to our great bookstore partners. Uh, Jess and I are here from Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, and Manchester Center, Vermont. And we have worked this evening with our great friends at Anderson's Bookshops, Books and Books, Gibson's Bookstore, Left Bank Books, and RJ Julia, Wesley and RJ Julia, and Bookhampton. So thank you all so much. And have a lovely rest of the evening, everyone. Take care. Bye,